secretly paying for research and staying on top of those who didn't, weren't getting their money from the CIA. But most of the big research programs in the early 50s, now this isn't the 60s, understand this, this is the early 50s. Most of the big research programs were funded secretly by the CIA, or military intelligence, American military intelligence, which was into it for the same reason, though the military were more interested in giving it to whole populations. In other words, perhaps rending an army or a city stoned and therefore unable to fight a war. And they, well, you know, the army literally was loading up artillery shells full of BZ, which is a, a psychedelic even stronger than LSD. And the notion was you could lob one into a fort somewhere and that would be the end of the re resistance. Now, it's not a bad concept. And when you think about it, it may be a better way to fight a war than with bullets. Uh. Okay, so in the, you have to appreciate that in the 50s, this drug was not something that was on the market. It wasn't around. It was something that you had to get a special supply from Sandoz it would be sent over in little boxes, which the CIA would be notified. Probably somebody like Dr. Harold Abramson, who was a doctor in New York, who was under the CIA's direct employ and getting money from them knowingly, would come around to your lab. If you weren't being paid by the CIA directly, they knew exactly what you were doing. Well, the CIA and military intelligence turned to our great universities to find out what was going on with the drug. So they set up a testing program at Harvard. There was another one at Stanford, one at Columbia. Uh, some, in other words, they put it out in those places where you found the scientists who supposedly were the ones who were most skilled. Well, the test subjects were guess who? Uh, college kids. And young psychiatrists and psychologists and graduate students and some of the interns at the hospital. In Boston, the, the, the big center of Har at Harvard Medical School was the Massachusetts Mental, Massachusetts Mental Health Center, a big teaching hospital right in the middle of Boston. The word got out about 1952 in Boston that th there were these people down at this hospital who were willing to pay you ten dollars to be a you know to be a schizophrenic for a day, and um, that was the way the drug was perceived at that point. It was it seemed at that point to be a drug that caused a psychotic incident. It was something that seemed to call what they called at the time cause what they called at the time a model psychosis. It was make. They thought it mirrored mental illness. Now, the idea occurred to scientists of the day that if you could cause mental illness, if you could find a drug that would block mental illness, you might have found a cure for mental illness, which wasn't a bad concept, except it just didn't happen to be true. But uh, that was the one they were proceeding on at the time. It was very difficult to tell if a person had had a psychotic incident or they were reacting to the drug because the symptoms seemed to be the same. So they were testing the drug at Massachusetts Mental Health Center. The word got around Boston that you could take this drug, that it would have certain effects on you if you did take it, and it got to be a very popular thing in certain student circles. Uh, people were, were volunteering for these um, experiments, and some of whom later went on to, let us say, po help popularize the drug, uh, spread it around. Now, one of the things they didn't understand at the time, and this was something that didn't come up till later, and I'm, I'm using 60s language to explain to you things that happened in the 50s, and there was no language to explain this, which was one reason they didn't understand it. When there's no language to explain something, it's very difficult to understand. That a person's reaction to the drug would, depended on two chief variables, set and setting. Neither of these words had any meaning at the time. Please understand that. Set being your mindset, who you were, what was your experience as a human being, where, you know, everything that had happened to you up at that point. Were you outgoing or ingoing? Uh, were you uh, flexible or rigid? I mean, all these things were, went on in your head and the drug, you would have um, react to the drug in relation to who you were. It seems rather logical at the point. Well, that isn't how the CIA or science of the era thought of drugs. They thought of drugs, you know, if you double the dose, you double the effect. I mean, that tended to be the way, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but that tended to be the way they looked at it. Set, in that sense, didn't, at the time, make too much sense. The other variable was called setting. Where you took the drug, the circumstances where you took the drug. If you took it on a beautiful spring afternoon, out at a farm with rolling mountains and sea, I mean, kind of like this campus, 
right? With, with people gambling around, skipping through the meadows, with people you love, you are much more likely to have a good reaction to it than if you took it in a mental hospital while you were in a straitjacket with guards, right? Again, not the kind of thing that the CIA had a, a great appreciation of at the time. And one of the things is most of the people in the CIA who were interested in doing things with this drug tried it themselves. Now, if you look at the kind of personality that people in the CIA tend to have, <laughs> let us say that paranoia might be too strong a way of expressing it. <laughs> however, however, if you are mistrustful in that profession, you're very good at it. You're not supposed to take p things or people at face value. You're supposed to be looking is he telling me the truth? Do I know that he knows that I know? You know, you're kind of back and forth. That's the kind of reasoning that you get, you get promotions for if you're in the CIA. Well, if you put a little acid into the head of that kind of person, they are very likely to have a major paranoid reaction. And I'm not telling you this because, as a guest, but having interviewed CIA people who had the experience, and I was told by one, a former CIA psychologist, that they were likely to think that all their colleagues were out to get them and that, you know, that, that, that the world was closing in on them and all of this kind of thing. Well, that was the kind of reaction that people in the CIA tended to have when they tried the drug. They never knew that, where they, some of them knew, but most of them didn't have much appreciation that if you tried this drug and you had a certain kind of personality and the setting was right, you might get off on it. I mean, again, that's 70s language, it's not even 60s language. But the fact was that people did get off on it. And being that this was America, and we had this wonderful free enterprise system, uh, that by the late 50s or so, the drug got out of the exclusive or nearly exclusive control of the CIA and military intelligence. Uh, where there was demand, there got to be supply. A black market was developed by 57, 58, 59. You could get the drug if you had tried it thanks to the CIA, you probably could then get it from an independent entrepreneur. Uh, and it became available. And it's kind of ironic because the CIA, you have to give them major credit for having popularized it, for having spread it around, for having set up the first major research programs in the area, for all the wrong reasons. I mean, they didn't do it because they wanted to turn on America, I assure you. And you may hear that from people who are into conspiracy. I don't think it's so. I think they made a very big mistake. That's my humble opinion. That's what I wrote about it. But they made a very big mistake. And the, the implications of it are really rather incredible. I mean, this is the social history of the 60s. But you have to give LSD some credit for breaking through what you might have called the consensus of the 50s. And there were other things you might have given some credit to. Also, there was a war going on in Vietnam. There was the civil rights movement. There certainly was a lot of marijuana around. There were lots of things. But a lot of the things that happened during the 1960s, the catalyst for it, or one of the catalysts, or a catalyst, and I don't want to exaggerate this too much, it was LSD. I mean, LSD did knock people off their belief system, their value systems. It opened them up. It wasn't an end-all, and it wasn't a be-all. But it was something that did, for better or for worse, change the face of America. I think everyone would agree with that. And when we think of LSD, we can say, thank you, CIA. Now, we can't say thank you, CIA, for all of it, because you can't give them sole credit. You can give them only partial credit. So, you know, if, if you, any of you go off for a new trip, you can think maybe three quarters of the credit, or two thirds, or 42 percent. I mean, I'm not sure what the percentage is, and I don't want to stand up here and give them full credit for it. But I can say that they did play a role, and the irony of it is rather amusing. To me, is rather, well, it's rather ironic, let's just say. Because I think when you look at that consensus, which came tumbling down in the 60s, uh, the notion which, on which the CIA's power was based. I mean, the CIA was a much more powerful institution in this society as long as there was a consensus for Cold War, as long as there was a consensus for an either-or approach in all international relations and things of that sort. And that started to break down during the 1960s, and LSD played a part. So I just say that there's some irony there, and I, as a student of ironies and a writer about ironies, was very happy to write about that one. Um, I'm going to show for you, at this point, part of a uh, videotape that comes from an ABC documentary 
that they did based on my book. They called it mission mind control, but they adopted it more or less verbatim, I mean, chapter by chapter. And I, you will note I keep cropping up with Tim Leary and some other people um, who um, w had something to do with the moment. It was shown on television in 1979. Uh, it's old history in a sense. I mean, I'm not sure how many of you happened to see it. It was shown at 11, 11.30 for an hour and a half. Uh, which had to do with the ratings wars and all of that. I don't even want to go. And I was very happy as an author to have my book made into a documentary because about 15 million people saw it, which is about 14,975,000 more than normally see my work. And, you know, and I'm fairly successful as an author. So, I mean, I want to tell you that it was good to have it in television. And I was a consultant, and I had the right to be there for the final cut, but not to influence exactly what came out. So I can say that it's not bad, and I like it a lot, and I have to cut this version myself by about 20 minutes. So it reflects me, and I won't take sole credit or responsibility for everything up there. I'll only take about 42% of it or whatever. Uh, I'm going to show it for about 25 minutes. We're not going to show it all. We're going to show kind of the LSD portion and some of the stuff about behavior control. And then I'll come back and maybe say a few more things and take some questions, and then I think Tim Leary's going to come out. So are you ready with that? And let's go ahead and show the video, please. Some of, it, some of the making of that was pretty funny. Uh, one, I, did, I cut the last part of that myself, and I cut out statements that were, I felt were a little ridiculous. Like when they used that graphics and they said, According to experts, this is the closest thing that's ever been put on the screen about what a real LSD experience was. I indeed encouraged the ABC crew to uh, try out, what, see what a real LSD experience was, but they didn't see that as their function in terms of investigative reporting. Now, it wasn't clear what they thought their function was in those terms, because, for instance, remember when he said, um, these this interview has been done by John Marks and verified by ABC News. Their verification consisted of reading my interviews. So, but in any case, it was good, and I was happy to have it on the screen. Um, there was some of the kind of one of the things I noticed up there was was Gordon Wasson, the man with the mushrooms, one of America's leading mycologists or mushroom specialists. And a little story he told me when I was interviewing him about, in, I think it was about 1958 or 9, a couple of years after those events happened, he and Albert Hoffman, who had become his friend, remember the, the Swiss chemist who had, be, uh, had discovered LSD, uh, you wonder what busmen do on their holidays. Well, they went down to see Maria Sabina in that village, Wasson and Hoffman. And Hoffman brought with him a pocket full of psilocybin, which you remember Hoffman had created in his laboratory, taking the the plant of the mushroom, in other words, going through it in a biological sense, and he had synthesized the active agreement, ingredient, which he called psilocybin. And he took a pocket full of psilocybin with him when he went down to Mexico. And of course, being a good chemist and a good Swiss, he gave to Maria Sabina when he got down there, the wonderful Indian shaman lady, he gave to her some of the psilocybin and said, now you don't have to get it from the mushroom. And one of the things about that mushroom is it's not available all year. The rains have to come down at the right time. So it's only there, I don't know, a few months during the year. And he told her that she could have it all year, and wouldn't that be wonderful? And she tried the drug and didn't get off on it. This is the story Watson told me. And he said, now you have to understand with Albert Hoffman, he's always very miserly with the doses of the drugs that he gets. So what happened, I mean, he said, he, Watson said that they just hadn't given, uh, Hoffman hadn't given the Indian shaman enough of the drug. So Hoffman kept giving her the drug and giving her more and more pills. And finally, she got off on it, supposedly, and said it was very nice and very good. Now, Watson, who is a natural man, he does not like the synthetic quality of psilocybin. He gets his through mushrooms. Said he just felt that Maria Sabina was being polite. <laughs> I have no way of verifying the story. I just rather liked it. Uh, in any case, uh, that was some of it, and I just would like to put out to you that there is a tendency when people consider these issues to see the hand of the CIA behind every bush. Uh, there's a lot of paranoia on this subject. There's a lot of people who feel that, you know, 
somebody is watching them or whatever. And I, I can say to you authoritatively tonight, the CIA is not behind every bush, they're only behind every third bush. And that really don't believe all you hear on this subject and that essentially the case is it's taken in there and as I've told you about as far as one can take it from a conspiratorial point of view. And that there probably isn't, I mean there isn't any conspiracy beyond that, at least none that I could discover. And I don't think it's there. Um, so I'd like to take some questions. I think that there, there was a way that we're going to get them up here. Weren't they going to hand them to me rather than... Well, I'll take them from the floor. Hey! What kind of research is going on right now? Do I know of anything? With the CIA? Yeah. Okay. It, with connection with the CIA or other intelligence agencies. But the, the thing about this particular subject is it's very hard to know because if something is a secret, it's hard to know. And if it was really a secret, then I wouldn't be able to tell you. So let me start off with that little uh, caveat. The documents I was given by the CIA essentially ended in 1963. Uh, that they chronicle 15 or 16,000 pages of documents of what happened more or less 1951 through 1963. Now I know that they had a major behavior control program that went on at least until 1973. I know because I had sources who told me about it and because the CIA had told me they had uncovered 140 boxes of material. That's about this stage full of documents from that period during the 50s and into the, I mean, into the 60s and into the early 70s, not the 50s, 63, 73 about. They wouldn't give me any of those documents under the Freedom of Information Act. The, the spigot just dried up. There was nothing to come out of it. So I know that they were doing stuff. Now, I don't think there was too much going on with drugs because from what we've seen with all the set, setting thing, that drugs don't seem to be the way to get up to the idea of 100% control. You can certainly hurt somebody. You can use drugs like a baseball bat. In other words, you can use it to kill somebody, to poison them. You can make their hair fall off. Uh, you can make them smell bad. You can make them have to go to the bathroom. These were all things that the CIA did. They had a whole way of doing it, but it was more drugs as a weapon as opposed to drugs as a control substance. As a control substance, it didn't work that well. There was talk in the CIA, for instance, of giving some LSD to Fidel Castro just before he got up to give one of those marathon speeches in the place of the revolution down in Havana. Now, it's my guess that if they had given such a drug to Fidel, he probably would have given a better speech. <laughs> I don't know that. But the fact was, you didn't know what was going to happen. There was this incredible element of unpredictability. You didn't know where the person was going to land. You, didn't, you couldn't know enough about the set and the setting to control the reaction. And I think that's why drugs turned out not to be very good in the intelligence business. Now, there were other ways of controlling people and manipulating people, some of which has been in the literature, some of which hasn't been in the literature. I don't know what research went on after 1963, but I would put out a few warnings before anyone gets real afraid that there's a secret way to control you out there, is that scientists are not real good at keeping secrets when they make major discoveries. Right? Now, if somebody had thought up a way to turn you into a robot, I think we would have heard about it or we would have seen some evidence of it. There's, uh, television, now that's a behavior control instrument in this society. You want to talk about behavior control in America, don't talk about the CIA, talk about Sesame Street. I mean, you want to talk about something that has a, a profound effect on the behavior of kids in this country. Talk about new technologies, talk about Sesame Street or whatever. I'm not saying it's bad or good, I'm just saying it changes behavior. And that's where the action really is in this field. The way the CIA was into it was very much in a micro kind of sense. I mean, if they had physical possession of a person, they had him in a jail cell or he was their prisoner in some way, there were some things they might try on him that might or might not work and that a professional probably could beat. Now, the macro question was much more interesting. Ways of changing behavior in American society, television, technology, computers, they have an incredible effect. Madison Avenue does research on this thing. There's a whole industry out there called the shaping industry, or that's what I call it, which religion people are into. Religious conversion, I mean, very close to the old brainwashing effect and things of that sort. And I'm not saying that that technology has ever gotten overwhelming, because I don't think it has. 
I don't think that there's some way out there of turning a person into a helpless lump of putty. But the fact is that that is where the action turned to in this field. Now, you have in prisons uh, and mental institutions, they're forever going to be scientists trying to find ways to find, you know, ways of handling people who are mentally upset, mentally ill, whatever, try to change their behavior. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. I mean, the use of uh, uh, lobotomy or, or shock to change the behavior of a person who's got some problems. Now, it kind of depends where you're sitting on how you react to that stuff. If the person's a, a rapist, you might have one opinion. If you feel it's, a, it's just a person with a high spirit, like in one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you might have another opinion. It really depends where you're sitting and what your point of view is. But I'd say the action has now more shifted into the social medical area and away from the intelligence area, as far as I know. Which isn't to say that the CIA isn't doing research in this area. Uh, clearly, they're putting money into parapsychology. It's not clear if they're putting money into something or to nothing. I mean, in other words, it doesn't seem to me to be a strong enough technology that one can use it, but the Russians are very interested in parapsychology. The CIA is very interested in parapsychology. I, there's a mirror effect, or, and the, I think that probably people in this country who are into that field, I mean, in the intelligence side, probably are the ones who are spreading around stories about how the, the Russians are always making advances. I mean, that's what research funds um, uh, flow out of. And I want to tell you that, especially in this day and age, if you promised to uh, academic researchers that there would be research funds, well, I mean, you get a lot of people who are real interested in getting those kinds of research funds. My guess is if the devil were to put out a research contract to figure out ways to undermine God, that probably you would get the psychology departments of 18 major universities who would do it to support their overhead. Now, that just happens to be the way uh, researchers are. If there's government interest in it, somebody's going to take the money to do the research. What's not clear is if they're researching something or nothing, and whether it really is impossible to control people uh, against their will by this kind of technology. And you can get into, it's almost an, ar an argument of philosophy. Uh, it seems, at least as far as the drugs were concerned, that ultimately the human spirit won out, that the human spirit did not want to be controlled, that at least as a CIA psychologist told it to me, he said if a per you were getting near the point of controlling someone, the person seemed to either go catatonic or, you know, I mean, or fall back. And it just didn't seem to work. And I don't know is, is my short answer with a lot of elaboration. I'm sorry? On, used on who? Civilian. Has BZ ever been used on civilians? Why isn't BZ popular? You want a trip for seven days? Well, that's the reason. I mean, it, I mean, BZ is a psychedelic, which, I mean, this is not a very scientific way of... ...or, you know, I mean, or fall back. And it just didn't seem to work. And I don't know, is, is my short answer with a lot of elaboration. I'm sorry? On, used on who? Civilian. Has BZ ever been used on civilians? Why isn't BZ popular? You want a trip for seven days? Well, that's the reason. I mean, it, I mean BZ is a psychedelic, which, I mean, this is not a very scientific way of explaining it, but it's thought to be about 10 times as long-lasting or as powerful as LSD, and tends to go on and on and on. Like six, seven days is not uncommon. Is that more or less six or seven days, would you say? Very confusing for six or seven days. Lots of physical symptoms, too, apparently. The Army was giving BZ to um, GIs, testing it in, um, at Edgewood Arsenal, and there was some military application. It was BZ that the Army put into artillery shells to think about lobbying at the Russians and other unfriendly populations. Uh, the Scientologists, for reasons that I do not totally understand, have a very special fixation on the drug BZ. Uh, 
in terms of doing research, and Scientologists have done some interesting research in this area. On the other hand, um, it, they get involved in issues of dogma with the area, and I am just, I say, beware of people who are doing research that fits dogma or doesn't fit dogma, because sometimes the conclusions don't come out exactly as you want them to come out, which is sacrilege. Uh, but in any case, BZ has never really been a popular drug because it's not something that people really can handle. And I don't know that it's ever been used on civilians. My guess is probably somewhere, somehow it has been, but I don't know that. Uh, in my research and looking at the CIA records, have I come across any other drugs besides uh, LSD, psilocybin, or BZ? No. There are drugs that even drug experts haven't heard about. Uh, we had a list. I mean, in all, incidentally, I gave all my documents to the Center for National Security Studies in Washington, so if any of you would like to continue this research, I mean, feel free. Uh, I, indeed, the Scientologists have been doing it for years. They went in and Xeroxed every one of my 16,000 pages of documents for their own files, which was fine. I mean, that was what they were available for. They paid 10 cents a page, and that was it. But there was a list. It was a lot of money, a lot of Xeroxing, but, you know, you know some people are into Xeroxing. Uh, now, the, uh, there was a list of drugs they looked at which had on it caffeine, uh, uh, cocaine, heroin, uh, marijuana. Indeed, there was a whole marijuana testing program during World War II where it took the geniuses in OSS two years to figure out the best delivery system. In other words, the best way of giving somebody marijuana was through the cigarette. <laughs> wow. Anyway. I'm calling on you. You're grunting enough. The gentleman uh, says that with his own experience of LSD and psilocybin, uh, it seemed to push him in a, what you might call a feminine kind of way. In other words, you experience more feminine, what are considered to be in this society, feminine qualities, more... He imagined himself as being a woman. Uh, and he asked whether I had any information, whether this drug had any effect in the 60s in bringing out uh, the women's movement. The gay movement. Uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't rule anything out. No, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be flip, except I'm being real flip. And, uh, no, I, I don't have any no, notion of that. And I think that the, the evidence seems to indicate that what LSD does is push a person in the direction that he or she is going in anyway. It seems to exacerbate. <laughs> I'm sorry? In Poland? Is the CIA afraid of the uh, movement of solidarity in Poland possibly happening in the, CIA, in the United States someday? I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Right, of the people who were tested in the 50s and 60s unknowingly, how many have asked the CIA for some sort of compensation? Is that, yeah. Um, well, there have been a couple of cases where the military gave it to people. Uh, there was a case, the guy was on 60 Minutes and actually was named Thornwell. Uh, uh, he was also in this documentary um, later on the part you didn't see. 
And he was given a good deal of compensation, I think about three quarters of a million dollars by the military for having had it used on it. They settled out of court. There was another case called Frank Olson. Uh, he was an a army chemist who the CIA gave the drug to unknowingly in 1953. Again, later on in the documentary. He, uh, his family found out about it in 1975 by reading in the Washington Post that an unnamed army chemist had jumped out of the window and committed suicide after being given LSD. His family sued the government. Uh, President Ford personally apologized to the family, and I think they settled for about $900-odd-thousand. Uh, as for the CIA testing program, in this country, there's never been anybody, as far as I know, who came forward and could prove that he had been tested by the CIA. Now, I want to tell you that there's a form of mental illness abroad in the United States, which is called the CIA controls my mind. Uh, it's people, and they all write to me, right? I mean, or call me on the phone. And it, I mean, I'll give you a very lay kind of opinion of what this entails. It's that somehow people ascribe what they might call irrational behavior, behavior they don't want to take responsibility for, to some outside agency. It used to be the Nazis or the communists or either my local police or my wife or something like that. It now tends to be the CIA because that's what you hear about in the news. Uh, now, I'm not saying that there isn't one or two percent of those people who might have some justification, might have had something happen, might have been an unknowing test subject in the past, but most of those people who call up and they say, look, there's a transmitter in my teeth, or there's a van across the street, or my television's doing it, but I know it's the CIA. Most of those people probably are not telling you what is actually true, though they clearly believe it to be true. My guess is in this audience, there might be a few of these people who would like to, you know, who could tell you some of these stories. Um, that's out there, and it's very hard to tell the truth, tell if the person's telling the truth. I mean, how do you know? Uh, one thing about the doing research on the edge of craziness is that you can hide it behind craziness. Uh, so, as a researcher, I was besieged by people who were calling me up or writing to me and telling me that these things had happened to them. Now, in at least one case, I was able to verify that it had happened to the lady. But on the other hand, she was able to produce hospital records that came from a hospital where I knew the CIA was setting up, had set up that program. She was, her doctor was the doctor I knew the CIA had given the funds to, so I was able to verify it to my own mind. Most of them I just rejected out of hand. There were a few that were in the gray area where I would look at the damn thing. One, one lady I went for a month back and forth. I mean, and it was clear that she had had a psychotic experience about 54 or 55, that her husband had worked in the CIA, that he had worked in the same office as this program was going on, and when they were doing testing on people in the office. I still had no way of knowing whether she had just had a psychotic incident or had been given some acid to, to get her off in that direction. But I would add that it, does, it did tend to send people in the direction they were going, though it could send somebody over a line where they wouldn't be able to function very well in the society, a person who might not have ever gone over that line. And incidentally, I'd like to say, I mean, we're being rather light about it, these are very dangerous drugs. In the sense that if you are not in a situation where your setting is okay, where your set is such that you're able to take this drug, I mean, it's not something I would trifle with. And I would put that healthy warning out there. I mean, some people have had marvelous experiences, some people have had bad trips. Uh, there's no answer or cure-all in these drugs. And it's something that I would just say, keep a very healthy respect for. Could you all hear? No, I heard, I heard. Uh, the, the question was that marijuana was much more of a mass drug. Uh, LSD was much more of an elitist drug. I mean, it was in smaller circles. And did perhaps I put too, too much, give too much credit to LSD and not enough to marijuana. Uh, I would say on that one that, yeah, that there's, there's a, that's true, but the fact was that LSD 
seem to be picking off what you might call some of your leaders, whereas marijuana, you know, I mean, who knows? I mean, let's give them both credit where credit's due. But, uh, Mar it, so it seemed to get people out of what you might call the mindset that they came in from the 1950s. They needed a more severe jolt than marijuana was gave. And maybe some of them got it through LSD. Others haven't got it perfectly naturally. I mean, let us not uh, minimize kind of the natural element of those times. Uh, there are people who came up all sorts of different ways. It was very much a situation where some people got radicalized by some dope, and most people got radicalized by the war in Vietnam or the civil rights movement or whatever. And I don't want to push this too hard. I mean, don't think that LSD or marijuana or any other drug was the catalyst for what happened. I would say it was a catalyst and had an important effect, but no one will ever be able to balance the one factor over the other. And I think marijuana certainly had an effect. It certainly had a more sustaining effect. Maybe people got going a little bit with LSD and it was maintained with marijuana. I don't know. I mean, people could argue this back and forth. I mean, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Yeah. If anyone has the answer to that one, I would invite them up to the platform. Gave LSD to who? Uns did the CIA ever give LSD to unsuspecting politicians? Well, I mean, if there were unsuspecting politicians going home with wars in San Francisco and during the 50s, probably. Um, overseas, for sure. I mean, I had a couple of cases of that. I mean, I don't know who it was, but people they wanted to discredit. Uh, baseball bat principle again. Um, and you could actually, that was one way it did get used in the field. I mean, you couldn't use it to control it, but if you gave LSD to a certain kind of personality, a personality of a person who's very uptight, very structured, you know, and had to hold control, you could be pretty sure that person might freak out if you gave him enough. I mean, if a person could flow with it, he was much more likely to handle it. And people who are control freaks, which might include, you know, some people we all have met in our lives, those people probably were likely to have a bad experience. If you gave them a strong enough psychedelic, maybe a little BZ, if you didn't think LSD would do it, and you could be pretty sure that person would have a bad reaction. Now, if you at that point called the people from the mental hospital situation, you know, called the guys in white jackets and said, hey, look, that guy's having a nervous breakdown, uh, you could be pretty sure that you might be able to discredit a person. Because in most places in this society, in most foreign societies, once you've had a run-in with the mental health system, you're discredited. To wit, Thomas Ingleton gets a few electroshocks and he can't be vice president of the United States. Right? I mean, that's a good way to discredit it. They did use the drug in that way with foreign politicians. Whether they ever used it with an American, I don't know. I mean, there were people giving, well, there was a group out in California where we are right now, actually, which uh, felt that the world could be transformed if everyone would get a little LSD in them. And they gave it to some pretty interesting, I mean, there was more than one group that had that particular bit of wisdom. Uh, but there, there was a group in, the, in California, and I'm thinking of specifically, that gave it to one person who became a prime minister. As far as I know, he has never been, he wouldn't be what you call a transformed prime minister. A member of a very prominent American political family allegedly had it. I mean, I have no way of knowing who I'm talking about at this point. Um, well, the answer, I don't know. I mean, I'm as a reporter, I try to be fairly responsible. And, you know, when you get an eighth-hand story, which somebody told you when they were kind of, you know, they were telling you stories that they didn't have any first-hand knowledge of also, I just assume not spread those on. Uh, the answer is, people in this country who became prominent politicians did have exposure to LSD during those days. Uh, probably, it, you know, it had some effect, but I didn't see the country ever getting transformed as a result. Uh, it seems to me that drugs are not ultimately the answer to anyone's permanent transformation or anyone's permanent enlightenment. What they seem to do is for some people, they may open up a small window, but if you can't get there other ways, you ain't going to be there. That's naturally. Have I heard that LSD is something of an aphrodisiac? No, but there, there are other drugs around that would seem to get you in that direction. I mean, there's no real aphrodisiac. I mean, there are drugs that seem to get people into empathy with other people, or so it seems. There's a drug around called MDA, which supposedly achieves that. Uh, anyway, last question. I'd like to wrap this up, please.
I don't know. Do you believe me? This is KPFK Los Angeles. We've been listening to John Marks, the author of The Search for the Manchurian Candidate and co-author with Victor Marchetti of CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. This talk was given at University of California, Santa Barbara Psychedelic Conference in January 1982. John Marks. Tapes are available of the conference um, from Sound Photosynthesis, Box 2111, Mill Valley, California, 94942. It's John Marks, the CIA's History of LSD is the... Uh, title, The CIA's History of LSD, John Marks, from Sound Photosynthesis, Box 2111, Mill Valley, California, 94942. Coming up, a little less naive view of CIA operations as we hear Dave Emery and Nip Tuck from KFJC Los Altos Hills presenting Archive on Audio Program Number 7, Operation Mind Control, Part 3, Cults. Three 90-minute cassettes, if you are able to record these off the air. KPFK Los Angeles. Ah, oh, the ragman does circles Up and down the black 